Hello, I'm Robin Vincent and welcome to the April edition of Molten Music Monthly and our special Superbooth 2017 show report. Now first I'd like to welcome all our new subscribers. I've had quite a few jump on board in recent times and now are you as confused as I am over who I am and what the heck I'm doing? Well let me quickly try to explain. This is a Molten Music monthly video which is every month I try to put together the latest news and exciting things from the world of computer music and music technology. But at the same time I'm also making videos about the Microsoft Surface Pro 4 and how interesting that is to make music with. I am the Surface Pro Audio guy. And at the same time as that, I'm investigating the wonderful world of modular synthesis. So I'm also the molten modular guy. And in and amongst all of that, my day job is actually building computers for musicians and studios. So I'm also the audio PC guy and the Pro Tools PC guy. And in my spare time, I like making videos about music software and music hardware and cool bits of music technology. And this is where we are. So at the moment, if it's a bit modular heavy, that's simply because that's where my interest is currently lying and I've got a lot of stuff to learn about that and so I'm producing lots of videos on it. I do have more stuff coming on the surface. I do have reviews of things like Bitwig 2, uh, the new Traction Waveform door. And for those of you who are here because of the talk about modular, then I'm, I've got some forthcoming videos on sequencing, on individual reviews of individual modules, and also how you connect that all together with computers and modulars and surfaces and the whole lot, all at once, right here on the Molten Music Technology YouTube channel. And yeah, it's, it's just me and I, I do what I can. So Superbooth then, what the heck is Superbooth? Well, Superbooth is a coming together of synthesis manufacturers and enthusiasts in a three day love fest of electronic music, technology, talking, discussion, noise, sound, and stuff. In only its second year as an independent event, it sort of evolved into the most interesting and engaging and culturally relevant trade show of the year. Superbooth used to be part of the Music Messer show in Frankfurt. And that was cool and everything, but trade shows are expensive. Music Messer is expensive to be at. And so they kind of broke out to try to forge their own way and to do the trade show better. They wanted to create a space where you could actually be heard where like-minded people could get together and celebrate the amazing gear that they create. It would be open to the industry, but also to the public, although not necessarily at the same time. And it would be cheap, you know, and accessible to pretty much everyone. The resulting super booth works brilliantly on almost every level. And I've not enjoyed a trade show this much for years. My first impressions were that of complete chaos. And there seemed to be like a massive wedding or something going on at the venue. And there's all these people in suits and dresses all crowded around the foyer. So much so that I couldn't work out quite how to get into the place. I mean, it's a fascinating building. I mean, it's like something out of Noah Hawley's Legion. But anyway, on the Saturday morning, it was packed, you know, for all the wrong reasons. Nobody was there for Superbooth. Everybody seemed to be there for something else. But once we'd crawled our way and pushed our way through, then we emerged into uh, this foyer, which was which had a load of stuff already set up and openly accessible. Now the Superbooth takes up three floors of FEZ Berlin, and they have this sort of trade and public policy where uh, everything is open to trade up until two o'clock in the afternoon, and then after that, it's then open to the public. This sort of gives all the manufacturers the opportunity to do some proper serious stuff with people in the industry in the morning, and then open it up to the chaos of the public in the afternoon, except for the area in the foyer, which is open the entire time. So whatever time you turn up, you can play with the stuff in the foyer. Now down in that space, you had some teaser stands from uh, Roland and Arturia and Novation, all showing bits of their stuff, but like the Novation had the, the peak and the mono station there, but they weren't working examples. They were just ones that you could have a poke at and chat to somebody about. Access had some big keyboards out, but perhaps most surprisingly was that there was a big space for Bastille instruments. I mean, they're awesome. They make crazy, interesting, really sort of rootsy modules. And I'm not really quite sure how well that fitted in with the chaos of the foyer. 
XAOC were also there. So were Polyend. I mean, these were, you know, serious companies with interesting and and perhaps complicated products to show. And I'm not sure that the foyer really did them any justice because it all sort of felt a bit like a shopping mall with disinterested people, you know, passing on either side. Anyway, I grabbed my press badge because I am that important and headed on upstairs. Now there's no way I can tell you everything that was at Superbooth. It's huge, it's enormous, there's tons of stuff. There's things that I didn't even get to see and there's stuff that I seem to see over and over again, such as the, the labyrinth nature of the building. So I'm just gonna pick out a handful of things that I thought were particularly interesting. First of all, Novation. They were probably, the star release of the show was Peak, their eight voice polysynth. It's desktop about the same size as the ARP Odyssey. It's got all the controls on the front that you could need. They feel great, it looks great. It's a good, solid piece of synthesizer equipment. You know, it sounded great, it's dead easy to use, move the knobs around, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the only trouble I had with it was that the, the data knob seemed to be always active. So if you accidentally brushed it as you were moving other things, it would move on to another preset and lose everything that you'd been doing. So that was a bit weird. But other than that, it's obvious, you know, there's three oscillators, there's stuff, filters, envelopes, all the usual stuff you'd expect to see. And it looks like it's an awesome product. It's priced quite high at 1249. That's quite a shock when you consider the sort of stuff we've been getting from Behringer recently and how we're all in love with these quite uh, budget and good value mini synths. But what I would probably say is that the peak is at the price that an eight voice polysynth really should be. And there seem to be a heck of a lot of quality in there and that should not be undervalued. They also have the mono station, which is kind of like a, a fruity Photoshop mock-up of a base station squashed into a circuit. And that's kind of what it is. You've got a sort of a two voice, two oscillator mono synth a synth, paraphonic synth, I don't know, with the pads of a circuit sort of jammed onto the bottom, which lets you sequence each oscillator separately, as well as a modulation track as well. Yeah, as like the circuit is a lot of fun to play with and having kind of the, the hardware of a base station right there under your fingers makes it easy and enjoyable. If perhaps a little basic, I mean, it, it's more like uh, a TB303, it's more like a baseline than it is a groove box. And in fact, I would probably would have been more interested if they, it also had the circuit engine in there as well. I mean, take a circuit, which has got you know, a, a digital synthesizer inside and whack into that, an analog synthesizer into that situation so that you have the drums, you have the sampling and the sample splicing along with uh, the analog sound of, uh, of, of bass and leads within there. I think that would be really exciting. But as it is, it looks like fun, it would sit well in anything else. I mean, they had it running with a circuit, so, you know, all synced up and stuff. And that seems to be an obvious use. It's not something you would necessarily use by itself. But nonetheless, it was pretty cool. Behringer then. Okay, Behringer had promised us two new synthesizers at Superbooth. And they, well, they kind of sort of almost delivered I suppose. First of all, we had a desktop version of the DeepMind 12. We were all kind of expecting that and had seen mock-ups of it. So that was no biggie. What we hadn't expected was a smaller DeepMind, the DeepMind 6. It essentially has the same sound engine as the DeepMind 12, just with only six voices. And they dropped out a few bits like the Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or some other irrelevant piece of technology that doesn't need to be in there. The keyboard is smaller, it's only three octaves. And consequently, all of the controls are weirdly small because on the DeepMind 12, it, the controls take up the whole panel and they're proper normally sized sliders and buttons and stuff. But on the DeepMind 6, because it's smaller, they've just made them all sort of narrower, which is all right, I suppose. I mean, the price is ridiculous at $699. So, you know, it's, it's really getting in there amongst the budget value synths and it's a six voice polysynth. I mean, it's awesome and extraordinary really. But of course it wasn't, strictly speaking, that new. What we had all hoped for was their, their Model D clone, their Minimoog clone, which they've been talking a lot about, but that wasn't there on the first day. However, it suddenly emerged unexpectedly on the second day, like it had just been delivered. Well, I think that's what had happened. It had just been delivered. They took it out of the box and went, oh look, 
it's the first one of the Model Ds. And so there's a lot more excitement about that, as you can imagine. I mean, it's priced at $399 and it's supposed to be a clone of uh, yeah, a £2,000 keyboard, a classic vintage £2,000 synthesizer. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I mean, I don't have any idea whether it sounds the same or not. That's a difficult call to make. And certainly I don't have the ears or the experience to know that. But, you know, it sounds like, it sounds like a little synth, I suppose. However, there are miniaturization issues again here. They've designed it to be able to fit into a Euro rack, which is fine. But it means that all of the knobs on it, I mean, in an image that you see of it, it looks completely fine. But when you actually have it in your hands, the knobs are weeny, really small, really weird. And the other thing about Superbooth is that you can go down the corridor into another room and play on a proper Moog Mini Moog Model D reissue. There it is in its entirety. And you can play on that and you can fiddle with the knobs and then you can go back to the Behringer booth and try that out. You know, it's just, it's just a different experience. I mean, if it's all purely down to sound, then, you know, we'd more or less be happy with software and the Arteria Mini V, you know, virtual Mini Moog. That would be awesome, but it's not about that. It's, it's also about the experience of handling, using and playing an instrument. And there was a huge difference between the Mini Mode and the, the Behringer Model D. Is that important? I don't know. I'm just talking about stuff. We shall see. But for 399, who's not going to have one? I suppose would be the thing. Oh, I don't know. Do I want one? No, to be honest, I'd much rather have little individual modules at this time of my life. I'm less interested in a larger synth voice but we shall see. Right, let's move away from the big brands and into something a bit more esoteric, a bit more interesting, a bit more earthy, rootsy and modular and small and perfectly crafted. Right, the rock stars of modular synthesis are undoubtedly Make Noise from North Carolina and Erica Synths from Latvia. I mean, both of them seem to deal with the chaos of modular in deep and creative ways. I mean, Make Noise make modules that seem to be completely bonkers, and Erica Synths always manage to bring the darkness to their modules. Now, unfortunately, they had stands which were essentially opposite each other at the top of the huge flight of stairs in the main hall. So you couldn't miss them, but it also meant that they were packed full of people the whole time, so you couldn't really get near to their stuff. I um, mean, I would have loved to have played on the Morphogeny weird tape splicing sampler thingy that Make Noise have done, but I just, I couldn't get anywhere near the stuff. On the Erica side, I did get a chance to have a poke at a few things, and actually it was Erica since that brought the cool new stuff to Superbooth. First of all, they had a black, of course, dual VCF, so it's two filters running in a single module that could run in either series, or parallel, so one after the other, or both at the same time, either on the same source material or on different source material. And it was good, uh, controllable, high quality stuff. And one of the, the really nice features on it had this spectrometer in the middle, these LEDs, which would kind of give an indication of the frequency content of what was moving through it, which was brilliant. I really liked that. I mean, because my ears are so crap, any visual indication to me is, you know, is really helpful. The other thing they had was this drum sequencer, kind of a drum sequencer computer. It had this keyboard on it, this keypad, if you like, that was just dragged out of the golden age of mechanical keyboards. It was beautiful. It was lovely. It was. It had all the resistance and the intention of, of a proper keyboard. I mean, it did feel a bit like you're an accountant adding up stuff rather than playing drums. <laughs> But what an awesome module. It's got 16 out, so you can run uh, you know, 16 percussion sounds, drum sounds from it. 12 of them also had accent outputs, so you could uh, not only trigger something, but then also add an accent to it from another output. The, the keypad gave you 16 keys, which could be the step sequence in itself. It could trigger patterns, it could be mutes, it could do the shuffle and the ratcheting and all that kind of jazz was all built into it. It was great. I mean, it's had a lot of fun to play with. I mean, you could see 
in the demos that you can run your entire show from it. I mean, not just for triggering drums, because you could also trigger other sequences with it. I mean, I could very easily see that module being sort of evolving into a desktop unit. I mean, sticking a couple of their Pico drum modules in there and you've got an entire drum machine sort of groove box going on that could be really interesting for the, you know, for the non-modular crowd. But as it is, fantastic, what a thing. Now, although Bastille Instruments were slumming it down in the foyer, they did have some interesting stuff to show. Amongst their usual sort of bits and pieces of innovative craziness, they had this thing called time. Time as in the herb time, an aromatic time. And what it was, was a box that kind of is a digital take on the tape analog delay machine. So a space echo or, or something of that nature. And they talk about it kind of exploring all of the space between all the different time-based multi-effects like you know, reverb, chorus, delay, uh, pitch shift, tremolo, flanging, all those sorts of things it messes around with. And it is fully digital, so it's not doing the, you know, the, the warmth and the smoothness of a tape slowing and speeding up again. Oh no, it goes into to bit crushing and lo-fi and it stretches sample rates and all that kind of jazz going on, creating lots of aliasing and other unintentional noise that some people like, some people don't. But that's kind of Bastille Instruments, really. That's their vibe, man. And it had uh, these uh, modulation robots built in. They like to call it a robot controlled tape, digital tape delay or something. Uh, and these robots are essentially modulated, so you choose a different uh, uh, modulation curve or modulation wave, and then that is applied to whatever the heck it is you're doing. So the usual sort of chaos ensues of noise and sound and bit crushing and reverb and delay and distortion and multi-tap and, you know, that kind of thing. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a box of digital tape weirdness. It's called Time. Super Booth is also all about the little guy, the guy with just a handful of modules he's come along to show them. And one such was Livestock Electronics. And I spoke to Daniel Mulder, the guy behind it, and essentially he's been building modules for a year, for just a year. It's kind of part of a, a university project and he also used to be into game music and was looking into how could he sort of marry a Game Boy into his Eurorack. Well, anyway, but. He's now got five modules that he's attempting to, to, to get to market, which were all very interesting. He had a four channel 16 step sequencer called Shepherd, which was kind of based on a loop idea that everything was, that also all the sequences were essentially loops and you could trigger those uh, in during live performance. And live performance was definitely something that he was most interested in. He had a lo-fi wavetable oscillator called Bang, where, which sort of chewed up waves and allowed you to mix two different parts together uh, to create very arcade sounding sounds. He had something called Maze, which was like a CV and audio signal mixing matrix thingy bob. And then he had a, a mixer inverter VCA thingy and a buffered malt. I mean, the design was great. I love the aesthetic, all the green stuff going on and the various animals and stuff <laughs> seem to be involved in it. And I think it's amazing that someone can can go from nothing to having modules to show at Superbooth in a year. That's extraordinary. I find that inspirational. I find that it just hints at the possibilities that are, that are in this industry. I mean, I don't believe anyone would have thought of just building a synthesizer a few years ago and taking it along to a trade show. But things like Superbooth and technology like modular synthesis really enables that kind of thinking that you can actually sit down and start fiddling with electronics, with programming, with the sort of tools that are available to us these days and produce interesting, creative and workable modular Eurorack modules. I would love to do that. I'm just never going to find the time. Probably the coolest looking rack of the show was by Zvex or Zvex? Zvex. Who knows? Anyway, they're a stomp box company that make guitar effects for guitarists obviously and they discovered that a lot of people were using their effects boxes for their modular rigs and so they thought well I know we'll stick them into a Eurac format and that's what they did they've got two at the moment the first one's called the fuzz factory which is some kind of chaotic mind 
melting distortion thingy. All of it CV controllable, so you can control the fuzz and the fatness and the draw and the pull and the crash and the crunch via CV. I mean, they describe it as having uh, the self oscillation, the gating, the gooey, sticky, velcro tearing fuzz, all of that strange, wonderful, interactive excitement has arrived in this incredibly controllable box of mayhem. Now, there's a marketing line you don't hear every day. The other one they had was Instant Lo-Fi Junkie, which is kind of a, a, a vinyl-y, chorus-y, lo-fi effect that just warps the heck out of your stuff. I mean, they're very much a boutique company, and one of the things that they offer is hand-painted front panels. And as I say, their rack just looked gorgeous. It was really, really nice and stood out amongst some of the other more, more sort of science-y, more technology kind of front panels. This was great. It was just pouring uh, the pouring of art across your front panels. I think that's lovely. Although it's probably expensive and takes a long time to do, but you know, even the standard artwork was pretty groovy, I thought. Now these guys had a little bit of a paradox going on. They were showing their weird sort of human impaling CV controller called Spikes. It has all of these touch points on it and a skull in the middle, like the sort of thing you'd have tattooed on your arm. And as you run your fingers across it, it creates all sorts of CV weirdness. I'm not sure if I can be any more precise than that. I mean, most of the videos I've seen, it just sort of go, I'm sure there's more finesse in there, but it's, it's kind of a, a noisy, controllable, self-oscillating, LFOing thing. But alongside this, they also had this, this thing called the Sonic Lullaby. It was just a little thing of beauty. It was a music box, a physical, you know, brass music box slapped onto a front panel with a contact microphone behind it. So when you wound it up and let it go, the sound would then emanate through your modular. And what they were doing was that they were sampling it through a sampler module and then messing about with it and warping it and distressing it and sending it all back out again. And it just created this lovely tinkling thing going on this soundscape of like some kind of poor <laughs> poor but charming child's nightmare i mean imagine if you were to run it into a make noise morphogeny i mean how awesome would that be i mean apparently you can get different barrels for it for different tune or you can get it to be hand moved so you can manually move it forwards and backwards i mean how usable that all is oh i don't know it was just a beautiful thing and i went to have a look at it purely because i heard this amazing sort of chimey sound coming out of their speakers and it just drew me in and that along with the spikes was just a great combination. Now this seemed to get very little coverage at the show itself which is a shame because it's an it's an awesome thing. Bavaco had brought along this complete Eurorack mixing solution. I mean mixers in Eurorack are generally pretty basic. Then little more than VCAs really they just you know you got four inputs and it gives you a summed output at the other end with some knobs on for level. Even some of the more extravagant performance mixers don't really give you much more than level control, maybe pan and mute buttons. But Faco says, sod this, we're gonna do the thing for real. So, I mean, how do you fit a mixer into a 3U form factor? That is very difficult. So they decided to not do that. And actually they're gonna fit it into two rows because the majority of people out there who are gigging with modular systems are gonna have at least two rows of modules. And so if you have half of the mixer down here and half of the mixer on the next row, that's a solution. It's a real solution and allows you to have a proper inline channel strip. So the first half, which is standalone, is called the hex mixer. And it's a six channel mixer. You've got control over level on a knob. You've got a three band EQ. Now you never see EQ like that in Eurorack. So it's awesome to have a three band EQ and you've got your inputs and your outputs and your master level. And there's also an EQ on the master level. Now the EQ, they say, is very, very steep. So it's, you can kind of sweep out the low, mid and the high sort of independently. It's a bit more like a kill switch on a DJ mixer. So those are very fierce on the actual channels, but on the master, it's a bit more traditional, a bit of a softer feel to it. The other awesome thing on this mixer are these Vactrol based mute switches. I mean, Vactrols are, are gates that are controlled by light. So when you flick the switch, it's a, it's a light that goes out and that gives it a very natural feel as opposed to just an electronic switch, which is turning on and off. And so the mute switches had this sort of 
natural and organic feel about them, but also they were momentary switches. So you could pull them down just to let the signal go through. Uh, so you could, you could hear each channel and then release it to, to mute it, or you could push it all the way up in order to let the signal come through completely latched. So it gave you this very interesting kind of playable performance feel to all of your channels. What a great thing. But this is only half the deal. There's also another unit called the Hexpander. And it's an, it's an optional extra, but it makes the mixer into a whole thing. And this sits in the row above and gives you a three auxiliary sends with stereo returns. It gives you metering, it gives you a headphone output, and it gives you a queuing system through uh, pre-fader levels. And the whole thing, you know, top and bottom working together was just brilliant. I mean, it's gonna use up a lot of your rack. That much is true, but I've never seen such a complete mixing solution on Eurorack. And they seem to have done it in a really interesting, a really creative and performance-based way. Now, the performance program is quite intense, but it's also one of the best things about Superbooth. After many hours of wandering around, we ended up sitting in this auditorium, which is fabulous old, cool auditorium, just to, you know, to take a rest. And it was quiet, blissfully quiet. We rested our little feet. But after a little while, some people were setting up on stage and we were treated to this performance from MFB. Now they've got a lot of noisy, crazy synthesizer boxes that I don't really understand. And it didn't matter because they just set up, they didn't try to give a presentation, they didn't try to tell you about their stuff. They just set it all up and they just started performing, making noises and music. And it just flowed and we sat there and just chilled for a good while. And that's an awesome part of Superbooth that you don't have to have a conversation, you don't have to understand the technology or understand the terminology. You can just sit there and experience the music. Because that ultimately is, is what we're there for, isn't it? It's why we're doing this, is trying to pull sound out of these boxes. It was totally thrilling. I mean, they've also got a venue outside and they had throughout the day performances, they had interviews, they had artists of various sorts there. They had manufacturers showing stuff, performing stuff, demonstrating stuff, talking about it, not talking about it. You know, that was a massive part of Superbooth. And although other trade shows do have performances, I think the emphasis that Superbooth put upon it is really awesome. You know, it makes it all about the culture. It makes it all about the community and the fact that we are making music together and how we are using all of these different tools and all these different bits of technology to do that. And it becomes a very engaging part of the event. Now there was so much good stuff to see and so many great conversations to have with very like-minded people. And it's impossible to cover everything. But to summarize some of the rest, I mean, Yamaha seemed sort of uniquely out of place with their huge, massive synthesizer workstations and pianos, but they did bring along a cool technological installation of a reface being sort of fingered by the prongs of a robotic interface. Arturia had a very cool spaceship to play in, but the only new things they'd brought along was the black colored beat step controller. So I don't think they really tried hard enough. Propellerheads and Bitwig were both there talking about hardware integration. Ableton were there and they had live controlling bits of Lego by the looks of it. And actually there was quite a lot of, of sort of coma electronic stuff going on with, you know, real physical world interaction with modular and synthesis and software. It's all very interesting. Avid were there demonstrating how Pro Tools can be the center of your synthesis journey uh, simply because all of the uh, HD interfaces are DC coupled. That's handy. Uh, Personas also launched their new top-end Thunderbolt audio interface that has also got DC coupled inputs and outputs. See, that's a really interesting trend and I hope that trend filters down to stuff which is a little bit more affordable. Kirkpatrick had a weird handheld kind of Game Boy device for making music on called Tungsten. Roly was there with his blocks thing, uh, as was Zoom with their kind of steering wheel tambourine <laughs> beat making halo thing that everyone was ignoring. There were cool controllers from Expressive E, their Touche thing, from Joueur, Joueur, from Joueur. This spongy, weird, crazy thing that still doesn't look any different than its Kickstarter for over a year ago, and I still don't think it's available quite yet. Hack and Audio had their big spongy black and red thing, which was really interesting. And Sound Machines were there with their 
arc thing that I didn't quite get to see. Jmox and Electron both had their new drum machine thingies going and there were so many modules that you couldn't count them all. And I'm really sorry if I've left anything out because I have left tons out. In fact, there was a whole load of stuff that I really, really wanted to see that I just couldn't find. And you kind of run out of time and energy, which is a real shame. And the whole thing is just like the best music shop ever, except you can't buy anything. So the intention of Superbooth is to, is to be a better form of trade show. I mean, one that respects the need for business to occur while emphasizing the community and culture of electronically made music and technology. It wants to connect people and give them the opportunity to, to use and experience new gear and new sounds in a creatively conducive atmosphere. And does it pull it off? Well, yes, mostly. The intensity of the noise down the modular corridors is either kind of heaven or complete sonic torture. The old trade show problem of not being able to hear the gear was something that Superbooth actively tried to remedy, but it's still very much in evidence, although not everywhere. I mean, you could be you know, <laughs> shouting, shouting at the, uh, at the manufacturer of a module that's right here that you're trying to listen to, and you're shouting at him, he's shouting at you, and you're trying to hear the bleep that it's making while there's a guy next to you bouncing up and down with his speakers going <laughs> and there's a guy behind you going it's just a cacophony of and you're trying to listen to the quality of that filter sweep yeah difficult i mean there are headphones they just weren't being used that much every single stand seemed to have their own set of quite large speakers and i think ultimately something is is going to have to happen there I did find the layout of the show quite confusing. Signs and directions and stuff were, were poor at best. And there was an area of the show that went around a lot. I kept finding myself back into this bit, whereas there are other bits that I didn't even get to, I don't think. And sometimes I found myself somewhere I wasn't supposed to be, somewhere completely outside the show. There's also very little in terms of Wi-Fi, so you couldn't just be going around the show tweeting, which was my plan. I mean, I'd, I made this big thing about uh, telling everyone, I'm going to be in Berlin, I'm going to be live tweeting the event and showing you lots of really cool, interesting things. I might even do a Facebook stream, but no, you couldn't do anything of the like. I couldn't get any of that sort of thing to work, unfortunately. And that's a bit of a missed opportunity because I think there's a lot of marketing and uh, promotion that can be done through people live streaming, through people tweeting and taking pictures and Instagramming. And although the big sort of media companies like, I say big, like Sonic State, Ask Audio, etc., were uploading their videos and getting that stuff out there. It would be nice for the rest of us to be able to do that as well, because that creates more ownership. It creates more of a community feel, so you're not just uh, at the mercy of what Sonic State want to talk about. You can see lots of cool stuff from everybody. There was also, dare I say it, a bit of a gender issue or a general diversity issue. I mean, it's not uncommon in music technology, unfortunately, but it was kind of sharply obvious at Superbooth. I mean, I would say that practically all of the exhibitors were white men in black t-shirts. And as I walked around, I saw perhaps one or two uh, women who were there actively looking at things. I mean, there are plenty of women who use the technology and perform with the technology. It's just not being reflected in the inventors and the makers and the manufacturers of the gear. I mean, in my opinion, sort of overwhelmingly white maleness is just not a healthy thing in any situation. You know, is that something that can be tackled? I don't know, whose job is it to tackle that? I have no idea. I don't know how you tackle these things. All I can do is just point it out. The general vibe, the, the feel of the place and the range of stuff that you could play with was completely excellent. I mean, I've been to many trade shows. I've been to NAMM, AES, and Music Missa many times. And largely, they're just sort of schmoozy industry jollies where you go on company expenses, have a riot of a time with the same sales reps that you would meet in your day job anyway. You know, they're just sales and marketing events. Superbooth isn't that. Well, at least not anywhere near as much. It needs to be sales and marketing, but it's also it's about people sharing a passion and showing off technology that they've built and sweated over and are contributing to an effervescent culture. I mean, you can notice the difference between talking to the guy employed by Arturia to talk to you about their gear 
and the guy who was demonstrating a module that he had designed and built himself. I mean, I don't mean to do a disservice to the excellent people who are there representing the bigger brands. It's just a different conversation. Yeah, and I believe this kind of show does the bigger brands a lot of good. It makes them realize where the passion lies. It perhaps reinvigorates them, or hopefully it reinvigorates their enthusiasm for the community, for, uh, for musicians, for people who are getting stuck in and using their gear. And hopefully it connects them with their user base in a way that shops don't, in a way that online doesn't, and in a way that trade shows don't. So it's good to have those bigger brands in there. I mean, because of the sheer wealth of stuff on offer, I don't think you can fit it in in a day. I mean, one of the frustrating things was that I spent so much time digging around and, and looking at the, at the new stuff and the gear and the technology that I really didn't have the time to sample the performances, to, to enjoy the interviews and the discussions and the music that was being made. I, mean, I really would have liked to have been involved in one of the DIY workshops, but how on earth am I going to fit that in? You know, perhaps it needs to become more of a festival than a trade show. Perhaps they need to sort of embrace that and push it into the weekend rather than it being mostly during the week. You know, maybe they could even look at providing space for camping and overnight accommodation and turn it into this this kind of weekend thing that we can all be part of with events going into the night. And that would give you the time and the space to properly sample what's on offer, to properly experience the performances, to experience the hands-on stuff, and to get in to the technology and to talk to people around a campfire about their stuff and their gear. I mean, I think that could be awesome if the weather's a bit better. But with all of this, it's just year two, and it's the most exciting, the most passionate, open and collaborative music trade show on the planet. It's electronic music, community and culture colluding in a couple of days of intense tech talk and music making. So yeah, it's pretty super. And next year, I'm gonna go for the whole damn thing. So there you have it, that's my take on Superbooth. Coming soon, we have, what am I working on now? I'm working on, damn it, I'm working on the Bitwig 2 review. It's gonna be, I think, in two parts. I'm gonna do a, a big review on a desktop and then I'm gonna do a separate video running it on the Surface Pro 4 with all the, the touch implementation. And then I'm gonna do stuff about it running modular and external equipment because that sounds like fun. So I've got that coming up. I've got reviews of individual modules and my next little project over that is to delve deeply into how you do hardware sequencing on modular. So there's a lot of exciting things to come. So please subscribe, you know, follow any of my Twitter handles. There's the Multimusic Tech one, there's the Surface Pro Audio one, uh, or Facebook pages, the Multimusic Technology Facebook page or the Surface Pro Audio one. I want everything or just subscribe to this channel and tell your friends, that would be great. And in the meantime, go and make some tunes. Mm -hmm.